Let's start with pericardial effusion. Notice that there is a small space here between the visceral layer and the parietal layer of the pericardium. Is this a tiny pericardial effusion or just the normal amount of liquid, about 16 to 18 milliliters, found inside the pericardial sac? How to be sure? A mode echo can make a difference. It has better temporal resolution and is known that during the small pericardial effusion, the layers of the pericardium don't touch themselves, as demonstrated here. See that during systole, the space between the visceral and parietal pericardium is well seen, but there is also a space during the whole diastolic period. This is not the normal amount of pericardial fluid, but a small pericardial effusion. This is a normal amount of liquid in the pericardial sac. The two pericardial layers seem to be merged. Due to high gain, they appear fused. When we decrease the gain, then we can see the visceral layer, the small space with liquid and the parietal layer of the pericardium. Notice that the liquid space disappears during diastole when the two layers are joined, indicating a normal amount of pericardial fluid. This is pericardial effusion. We classify it as small when there is a small space back here without any anterior space other than the normal. The space is just seen here. It does not reach the apical region of the left ventricle. Now a moderate size pericardial effusion with a larger amount back here, reaching almost to the apex. And we can notice also liquid situated at the front of the heart. Both long and short X show easily the liquid. When there is a large pericardial effusion, we see a great amount of liquid at the front as at the back. There is liquid all around the whole heart. The main finding for the correct diagnosis of pericardial effusion is observed when we demonstrate the entrance of the inferior vena cava into the right atrium, seen in a subcostal view. Here we can see very well the walls of the IVC entering the right atrium. When there is obvious fluid characterized by this anechoic region right on top of the IVC wall, we can be sure of the presence of pericardial effusion. Why is, is this so important? First, because it's the most posterior region of the pericardial sac when the patient is lying on his back on a recumbent position. Minimal amount of pericardial effusion, if present, will be there by gravity effect. Second, because as we will see later, the deposition of pre-epicardial fat around almost all ventricle walls and occasionally also the atrial walls that may simulate pericardial effusion will never exist in this region of the IVC. Then, if there is no liquid space in this region, of the IVC, we cannot consider the existence of pericardial effusion. This is an example. Notice the entrance of the IVC into the right atrium and large amount of fluid in this region. This is pactognomonic of pericardial effusion. Fibrinose pericardites produce this exudate that reminds a bread and butter aspect due to fibrin deposition. This appears to echocardiography as these structures. Some like filament and others like these irregular shaggy borders of the hard walls. 
Here we see an example with some fractured fibrin filaments and very shaggy. Irregular borders of the whole heart. Notice that some regions the fibrin deposition may be very large. Fibrin deposition may be quite intense and may occasionally seem neoplastic implant in the pericardium. There are some uncommon situations of a pericardial effusion, like those encountered in post-operative open-heart patients. In this case, the anterior pericardium is fused with the anterior chest wall, and there is no more pericardial cavity anteriorly to the heart. Then, in a large effusion, there will be only liquid behind the heart, like in this case. Look at the anterior space is an enlarged right ventricle and not a pericardial effusion. TEE usually is not necessary to confirm the diagnosis of pericardial effusion. We will also see an echo-free space behind the atrial and ventricular walls when fluid is present. TEE may be more useful in patients right after a cardiac surgery in the ICU when the best situation for a transthoracic echo is not possible. The patient is all draped with several thoracic tubes, a large surgical wound and a lot of remaining air in the chest wall and mediastinum. A transthoracic echo with this situation may not be trusted. It's an obvious indication for transesophageal act. Look at this case. Right post-operative revascularization patient with hypotension in the ICU. Transthoracic echo was not diagnostic for the cause. Transesophageal echo showed a large intrapericardial clot pressing the right atrium. Patient was back to the operative theater and the clot was removed. Echocardiography is also very useful to help during a pericardial tap. It can show where there is the largest space full of liquid between the thoracic wall and the heart. We can also follow the needle during pericardial synthesis. Just to remind, the needle is only this point here. All this line is not the needle, but reverberations from it. We also can provide the better place to put a catheter to remove the remaining fluid without hurting the heart. 